I was just in the middle of stabbing the yellow legal pad with my finger, driving home my point, showing my buddy David the notes that I had made to win the argument with him on my view of end-time eschatology when the teacher walked up and said, guys, you need to stop this. We were, we were in our second year of drafting class in high school, which I'd signed up to take because for much of my childhood, I thought I was gonna be an automotive engineer until I met an engineer later and realized I was probably not gonna ever be an engineer. But at that point in time, me and David were new believers. We'd just come to Christ and we're growing in our aspirations for ministry. And many of my friends I went to church with at that time were going through seminary. So I was reading everything they were reading and trying to be a wannabe mini Bible answer man. And we would get into these heated debates when we were in drafting class together. The problem is in drafting class, you have these very large desk you use for drafting. We're a good distance away from each other and we would get pretty loud. And sitting in between us was poor Jake. Uh, Jake was a metalhead, self-proclaimed atheist who thought we were absolute idiots for even believing the stuff in the Bible, let alone spending so much time debating about it. And I think it was Jake who probably went to our teacher and said he had had enough of us. Until one day, Jake, in an accidental moment of vulnerability, explains why he thinks it's so idiotic to believe in a God that would allow evil things to happen in the world. Because his certainty about God's non-existence was related to the one time he actually prayed to God, which was asking him to not let his grandmother die. Because if anyone deserved to be in heaven, it was his grandmother. And if anyone deserved to be healed, it was her. And he felt God didn't answer that prayer the only way he could get back at him was to kill him in his heart. And I realized that day how little our arguments and our pontificating mattered to a broken heart in desperate need to know the love of God. It is interesting today we can spend a lot of time debating about who's right. So much time that we actually miss the opportunities right in front of us. When Gary invited me to speak on this topic after the surveys for sermon topics this summer to really speak about loving people across the divide of either faith or politics, religion, uh, you name the topic that divides us these days, my first thought was, there are probably not a lot of people on staff in line to tackle this one. <laughs> uh, but then I thought about what I do for a living. Uh, I run an organization called Lift Orlando. We are a place-based community development organization that actually gets business leaders to partner with residents and community partners to help strengthen neighborhoods so people can thrive. But in that work, we cross a lot of bridges between uh, Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives and black and white and wealthy and poor and people who can invest in a community and people who wanna fight for that community. And in that dynamic, we are constantly trying to bridge uh, environments that might otherwise be divisive in order to create something better together. In fact, we started because we realized that the data pointed to a long history of successful transformation in communities born out of humble, bottom-up grassroots work where communities decided to organize a volunteer HOA or a neighborhood watch program or a Main Street initiative. And suddenly, you don't want to deal drugs on that corner because there's eyes on the street. People are talking to each other. And some say the only reason for the dramatic drop in crime over a 40-year period since 1980 to 2020 could be related to this phenomenon in every major city. There's been no major legislation or policing change that explains why we've gone from the war zones depicted in the movies of the 80s and 90s to really only but a few places in Chicago with anything similar until things got shut down with the pandemic and now we're seeing a spike in crime again. We knew that that model made communities healthier even safer, but not necessarily more prosperous. And yet there was a model that very successful at changing the economics of a neighborhood. But it's usually a top-down, real estate intensive, capital heavy, municipalities, developers buy up undervalued assets, they redevelop it into an area we all get excited about the new hip restaurant in town, but the people who used to live there end up displaced in the weekly, monthly motels outside of town. So we realized these were two very incomplete but powerful approaches. How do we get them to work together? Well, they're a little like oil and water. People who want to fight for their community don't trust people with a lot of money to change it. And the people with the money who could change it don't care for your opinion on how to spend it. So how do we get them to be on the same path long enough? I keep a picture of a train in my office. It reminds me, if you go to a train at the train station, you're really excited about where you're going. Unless you're a train aficionado, you notice the engine, the cars, you think they're cool. You almost never think about the rails. And no one ever thinks about the ties that hold the rails together. In some ways, we exist to be those ties. 
Who cares who gets the credit about what we do? Are we creating forward motion, progress, and prosperity for the people that we serve is really the thing that we care about most. Today, the inability to do that is dividing us in ways that are so painful. In fact, the level of isolation and loneliness that's being reported is alarming. Cigna Health did a very recent uh, study. They found 46% of respondents said that they feel lonely and alone for some or much of the time. For teenagers exposed to two hours of social media at the very least, we're reporting double that. Um, and what's interesting is it's not just, you know, the advent of the iPhone and social media and its ability to pull us away from other people. The other studies have found, very interestingly, that it's in fact the, the fear of interacting with people in the real world. In other words, if I'm at a grocery store, or on a subway station, on a bus, in a public setting where I normally would have stricken up a conversation with a stranger that could have gone anywhere, people are so afraid that that person's gonna behave like the trolls I see online that they'd rather not engage and they dive back into their phone. And it's harming us at such a deep level. How can the body of Christ be what brings us back together? Uh, the topics that divide us so much have made us have to feel like we must choose between how badly do I really want to connect versus how badly do I want to be right. I remember as a newlywed, one of the very frequent uh, pieces of advice I would get from people like, hey, you can either be right or be happy. <laughs> like it was this mutually exclusive proposition, but maybe it isn't so much. My hope today with our time is to prepare you for that next Thanksgiving meal, family gathering, that Zoom call where somebody brings up the awkward subject or, you know, Uncle Jeffrey wants to go on the politics rail again. Like, how, how do you engage in those moments where you really want to connect with people you care about and even love, but don't want to compromise on what you believe? Is it possible to do that? There is a passage in scripture that in, in these tumultuous times has become a favorite one for me, but I've had to look at it with fresh eyes as I've prepared uh, for this sermon. Uh, it's in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 3, verse 6. And it's the story of Jesus once again in the synagogue after multiple encounters with the Pharisees who were not happy about him repeatedly working signs and wonders on the Sabbath. He's breaking a cardinal law. He must be punished. They are all worked up about this and they are just daring him beneath their breath to do it once again. And he is finding himself at a moment of opportunity uh, to communicate something much more important. Chapter 3, verse 1 of Mark, it says, Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good? or to do evil, to save life or to kill. But they remained silent. And so he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and the hand was completely restored. I've, I've loved this verse because it's Jesus being a bit of a rebel, right? It's Jesus like sticking it in their faces. Like they've been having this debate back and forth and he knows they're in the audience and you can see them just staring him down with their beady little eyes. Like, don't you dare. And Jesus tells the guy to stand up and I'm going to do it right in your faces. But as I prayerfully thought about this passage, I actually don't think that's what Jesus is doing. I think Jesus is trying to drive a very different point. That while you're worried about winning an argument, there's a life in need right in front of you and you're missing the opportunity for why you were given this truth and this law. But there, a, re a friend had me look at the next verse in this story uh, and it really revealed something so interesting. Verse six says, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, this makes no sense. 
The Pharisees are the most right-wing, conservative, religious, let's go back to being a theocracy under Mosaic law, we need to go back to the good old days. And the Herodians are the most liberal, left-wing, let's forget the reign of what we've been in the past and live under the reign and power of Herod as our leader. These two groups hated each other and no reason to ever get along. And Jesus is so opposite to their two polar extremes. He's the one person who actually unites them in the will to take his life. What is it about not succumbing to either of the polar opposites in our environment that makes us almost outcasts in that context? Well, there's a passage that I want you to cling to as I've been clinging to lately. It's a beautiful verse in the opening chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 17. And there's a phrase that I think offers hope, offers strength, offers inspiration for how we can walk graciously and honestly through these difficult circumstances. And it says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to look at the grace to seek connection with other people and the truth to stay true to your story in every relationship. And before we end, I want to make sure to share with you what I believe may be the biggest and strongest bond that you can build with other people, regardless of which side of whatever topic you're coming from. And it's probably not what you think it is. A few years ago, uh, the, I had the experience of realizing how people passionate for truth, wanting to stand for what is right, could miss the opportunity to serve the needy right in front of them. One of the first sites that we acquired at Lift Orlando to redevelop was uh, where there was a Planned Parenthood operating, second busiest Planned Parenthood in the city, and you could see the people sitting off and outside because their lobby wasn't big enough, but there was also always a congregation of people outside with, with posters and banners and horrific pictures with graphic images, regardless of the fact that there was an elementary school around the corner and kids had to see all that every single day. Or the fact that I've talked to wonderful members in this, on our very own community, who have told me in their younger years that's where they went for care. Um, because it was a place that they could, they had access to, they could provide what they needed at that time. And, uh, we wanted to provide a, a, a new version of healthcare access in the community on that same site. And so there was an awkward few months as we talked to them about buying that property. This is circa 2015, 16. They're in the news all the time nationally. Things are pretty heated, but we eventually were able to acquire that building. And uh, in the process, however, uh, there was a short period of time where after having sold the business to us, they requested a brief extension to finish uh, relocating and um, the group that had been protesting found out that we were now the owners of the building. <laughs> and the onslaught of hate mail, email, voicemails, letters that went after me, my staff, the members of our board in person on social media was ruthless with so many graphic depictions and attacks that made me really question how this could be coming from someone who had the mind of Christ. At one point, uh, the leader of that group requested an audience and uh, I went out to the lobby to meet the person and it turns out there were about a dozen people uh, there waiting for me and so we went into the conference room and they want, went on to tell me all the ways in which we were evil and we were doing heinous things. And by the end of it, I said, listen, I know that you are passionate about protecting the unborn and about caring for those who cannot speak for themselves and standing for life. And we're, we're for all those things. But the way that we're going about this is very, very different. And I challenged them and said, listen, you can believe or not, that we're here to try to serve the community, to serve mothers and children. But what I am really curious about is when we do do what we say we're going to do, will any of you be around to love and care and provide support and encourage and not just attack? Because I knew of friends who had sat outside of that clinic and had been the onslaught of those attacks that were not, they were not there for what people thought they were there, but they were receiving a very ugly side of what the body of Christ can look like at times. That idea of being able to not miss what's right in front of us, of creating, in fact, safe places for all kinds and all types, I think is something Jesus modeled beautifully. 
mean, you think about the, the eclectic group that were the disciples alone. <laughs> I mean, this combination of, of quiet, timid, and ferocious, temperamental fishermen and tax collectors, and you had a, a, a zealot anarchist, and, and you had a traitor and a thief. And all of them felt safe with Jesus. One of the rarest things people can experience today is a safe place to come together. I have a dear friend I haven't seen in a long time, and she told me the story about why her favorite holiday was St. Patty's Day. I thought it, was, it wasn't Christmas, it wasn't Easter. And then she explained her mother being Italian, her father being from an Irish family. When they married, it was a scandal on both sides. And the animosity and the vitriol that lasted for so long was so painful until one day her grandmother woke up on St. Patty's Day, donned a green hat and said, we're celebrating St. Patty's Day. And as the Italian matriarch of the family, she opened up a whole new chapter for both sides. Is our desire to connect with others, to be a loving, safe place, greater than our need to win an argument, our need to win the fight? Now, wanting that, seeking that, doesn't mean you have to betray what is true. Doesn't mean you have to walk away from what you know is wisdom. I remember Giselle and I uh, being at a retreat for a nonprofit, an organization that we care deeply about, and they had arranged this uh, special time away up in the mountains in the second home of a generous family. There were a lot of other wonderful, generous people there, many of whom loved the Lord deeply. And uh, some of them seemed to held, hold a particular uh, worldview when it came to politics. And uh, after a few conversations, I could tell were a bit awkward, whether trying to relate to what I do for a living or figure out what our stance was on this issue issue or that issue, I said to Giselle, I was like, I think we're confusing people. Because <laughs> they don't, are, are these folks Republicans or Democrats? Are they conservatives? Are they liberal? Like, where exactly do they stand after all? And this, this is the mystery of the Pharisees and the Herodians, who are completely opposite in Jesus, yet can offend both, can offend both the conservative and the liberal. The fact is, this dichotomy has been a challenge for us since the founding of our nation, almost. George Washington, before he died, talked about his fears that America might not last very long. Because in his lifetime, he saw best friends, Adams and Jefferson, go from buddies to mortal enemies. The kind of things these guys said about each other while they were running against each other for the presidential office were so heinous and awful, they really make the stuff we see today in the media sound like child's play. And some people wondered, will, will this little new nation really ever survive? Well, historians say that we actually go through periods like this uh, with almost predictable cycles of time. You fast forward to the Civil War, over 600,000 lives were lost. And certainly if there was a time this nation would have ended, it would have been uh, then. Fast forward again to the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. And, and some say we're there again now where it's so hard to come together. It's so easy to find ourselves being divided. Sadly, the church has not been immune of this problem. We've swayed back and forth. In fact, uh, author of Letters to the Church, Pastor Francis Chan, uh, said this, throughout history, Christians have, led, have had a tendency to be both conservative and liberal, to be about sound doctrine and preserving our, our long-standing values for truth, as well as being for charity and serving the poor. It was conservative, liberal. For a long time in this country, Christians and conservative Christians were pro-life for the argument that the government shouldn't tell women made in the image of God what they should do with their bodies. But for quite a while now, or were pro-choice, I should say, and for quite a while now have been pro-life. Um, the, being pro-evangelism uh, first, or stewarding the environment as God's stewards, that marriage is the basic building block of society, that sexual purity is important, that we should stand for social justice, all of these ideas born out of the body of Christ. Conservative, liberal, Sometimes we've even changed our mind. I mentioned our stance on abortion hasn't always been the same. For a long time in our history, most Christians were anti-war. Uh, come the Cold War and in 1957, we're putting in God we trust on the U.S. dollar and faith becomes synonymous with being American. And suddenly we're very pro-military. There was a time in our early days where some colonies outlawed the practice 
of celebrating Christmas because for a very long time, most Christians believed that to be a pagan holiday, that Easter was the true holiday of the body of Christ. Then a Christmas carol came along and now we get angry if Starbucks cups aren't Christmassy enough. <laughs> Are we fighting for the right issues? Are we drawing a line on things that really matter that much? How we debate and argue about truth and where we land in relationship with each other oftentimes can be uh, misinterpreted. I remember interviewing Dr. Sandy Sugar, uh, former president of Valencia College, amazing leader in our community and a man of faith. Uh, the Life Work Leadership Program uh, here in town, when I was in that organization, we were uh, hosting a discussion about the topic of integrity and the subject of truth. What is it? How do you define it? Came up. And at one particular table, I had two leaders who are amazing folks and dear friends. One of them, a serial entrepreneur, was on his third search engine optimization company, a programmer uh, by trade, and a real sort of binary thinker. And that's the way he put it. Truth is binary. It's ones or zeros. Something is either true or it is not true. It's that simple. At the same table, uh, a dear, very wise and godly woman uh, who is a political consultant said, yes, but in some human dynamics, your truth is different from my truth. And how do you reconcile that? And as they began to get at each other, I, I looked at Sandy. I said, Sandy, what, what do you say on this topic? And Sandy said, listen, there's only one absolute truth. But there's not a one of us that has a complete understanding of all that is that absolute truth. All of us are growing in our wisdom and trying to be faithful and obedient to what the Lord has revealed to us thus far in our journey. It was F. Scott Fitzgerald, author of The Great Gatsby and other works, who grew up Catholic and said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. I came across a study done uh, by Harvard uh, addressing the ability for leaders to uh, relate and be relatable in these tumultuous times. And they described the recommendations that came out of the study as a recipe for receptiveness. Uh, and they described uh, five basic practices as a recommendation. And when you're having a conversation with someone with very different view, or you're trying to engage in a create a safe environment while still talking about things that really matter. Number one, acknowledge, actively acknowledge the other person's perspective. So when they tell you what their point is, you don't even have to agree with them, but don't launch into the argument you've been building in your mind the whole time they've been talking. <laughs> like prove that you actually were listening and repeat back what you heard and say, okay, if I understand you correctly, you're saying you believe this for this reason and just repeat their point back to them to acknowledge that you understand where they're coming from. Two, highlight the areas of agreements. In the vast majority of cases, 70, maybe 80% of the time, people with vehement disagreement with, between each other have something that they do agree on. Sometimes they're arguing for the same reasons. They're motivated for the same cause or concern. State that, say it out loud. Listen, I, I, I think we should protect our children. Yes, I agree, these times are super stressful. Yes, politics can be awful at times. And then as you start to make your point, be cautious to head your claims. Don't make statements in absolute. Say like, listen, the way I see things, the way that I understand it, or my favorite is I could be wrong, it happens all the time. <laughs> but, but here's my view and when you present it, Phrase your arguments in the positive. Don't phrase them in the negative. Don't make this about tearing down where they're coming from. Here's why this is something that I think would be good, uh, that I think most of us would want. And ultimately, don't patronize people. Don't talk down to people. Don't, don't lecture them with, you know, well, because and therefore, and, and make this your moment. Um, lean into the opportunity to connect around a conversation about truth. But maybe the debate about that truth is really an invitation for relationship. You might walk away with still very different understandings, but better for having connected and debated. Uh, grace and truth means you become a safe place for other people. People feel that around you, they can say what they feel and what they think. And they don't necessarily expect you to disagree with them, Maybe you'll have, they'll have an interesting conversation with you, but they won't feel like they have to hide who they really are. 
You may be a parent dealing with the views and beliefs of your children that you have no idea where they got and have no idea how to debunk. Or a child who is coming to the conclusion that as much as you love your parents, uh, you may never win them over to your point of view. Believe that you can have conversations that are loving and safe without having to fight to win an argument. Now, it's important to remember if someone's being completely unreasonable. Emotional maturity means that you have some degree of self-control. Don't react to the onslaught of whatever somebody throws at you, forgetting that if they're that upset about it, if they're that passionate, it probably has little to do with you. <laughs> There's probably more going on in their story. There's a reason that they're so adamant about this. There's a reason that the way they came at you uh, comes so strong. I had someone here at Summit who I just made me laugh so much every time I think about this, but he, uh, I think I'd just spoken that day and they walked me out to the car and, or they met me as I was my way out to the car and they were like, hey, I'd love to spend some time with you. And I said, sure. And, and, and they said, yeah, because you rubbed me wrong. <laughs> I was like, okay. And they were like, no, 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 but I feel like if we talked about it, I mean, it's probably me. <laughs> But his forthright, honest nature of saying, like, for some reason, I maybe don't like you that much. Sometimes it could just be you remind somebody of someone else. Uh, so have the maturity to not internalize the conflict and just engage in humility in that conversation. You know, winning over every argument shouldn't be the goal. There's a passage in Acts chapter 15. Paul is confronted with Jews who are trying to convince Christians and make the argument that they have to get circumcised and they have to abide by the law. And uh, he and Barnabas make the trip back to Jerusalem to go back to headquarters. And all the way they're going, they're telling stories of what's been happening in the Gentile world, really kind of building a case. And when they get there, they finally get a resolution, the instruction that they do not have to get circumcised. They do not have to follow all the Mosaic law, to not eat animals, sacrifice to idols, to stay away from consuming blood and from sexual impurity. And so he goes back with the uh, good news that there's this unifying vision of what it means to uh, be a Christian and it does not require something that is more than grace and the good wisdom of God's law. And the next chapter, we find Paul getting Timothy circumcised because of the Jews. <laughs> Uh, they were causing conflict around Timothy, who was half Jew, half Greek. And um, is Paul compromising here? Is Paul deciding to go back on what he just fought so hard to argue? Or is uh, Paul deciding there are other more important priorities than proving them right or wrong? What else is going on there as he's either resolving conflict for Timothy or helping Timothy live with the part of him that is so Jew? Uh, in Antioch, we see the early missionary church be this beautiful example that for me was a great source of inspiration when we were first talking about having a teaching team here at Summit. Uh, in Antioch, you had a leadership team that was incredibly diverse. Uh, men like Barnabas, who was a Hellenistic Jew growing up in uh, Greek culture. Simon, who was black. Uh, you had also Lucius, who was an immigrant from Northern Africa, who could talk to the immigrant population there. Manan, who was a foster brother of Herod and a member of the aristocracy, who could talk to the wealthy Roman citizens and aristocrats. And the least of them was Saul, who was an Orthodox Jew, the one who could go into the synagogue and teach. Now, do you think these guys agreed on everything all the time? <laughs> I mean, this is a crazy collection of different views and backgrounds, and yet they present such a unifying front for the church. This becomes a primary missionary church of its time. The early church expands throughout that entire region because of this kind of unifying leadership. This is what we hope to provide uh, here at Summit. This is what we hope to become for every member here, to know how to be a safe place for each other and for the world, even as we stand for God's eternal truth and the good hope of his kingdom and this gospel. So when you are in your next uh, interesting conversation, it is useful to think about, you know, what would Jesus do <laughs> in this moment? Um, but maybe if it's helpful, you could also replace that with another relevant reminder. What would a wise Christian do? <laughs> um, what would a loving, kind, Christ-like person do? Or what would me on my best day do? <laughs> uh, to be able to engage with humility in conversations in Christ-honoring ways, to have the courage to connect, to be willing to accept people, 
not analyze their position. I heard someone say that analysis is the most violent of mental acts. It's like dissecting something. You cut it up, organize it, put it apart, and you now may understand it, but it's definitely dead. A good reminder of how to engage uh, with people that we care about is to love people as is, but treat them as if. Love them just as they come, exactly with what they bring, and accept them as who they are. But treat them as if you're on the same team. Treat them as if they are the best and most amazing version of themselves, as if they are everything you hope for them to become. Don't wait for them to become that. Treat them that way now, because that's what Jesus did for you. And you'll be surprised how often humans will live up to great expectations. I um, did finally get to see uh, my classmate, Jake, actually say hi to me in the hallway <laughs> instead of ignore me um, after an opportunity to connect over a place of pain in his heart, but not because we won every argument. And over the years, I've seen friends uh, that because they found a safe place, eventually explored faith and joined the family of Christ. I had that group of protesters ask for an audience once again. I was told that somebody was at the front desk, and so I went over, and uh, it was the leader of that group, and she gave me a hug and said thank you when she saw the building coming down. And I said, thank you for doing that, but what I really want to see is will you be there uh, when we open a place that's for mothers and children, for families and seniors, the heart of Westlake, as it's called today, has been named by residents, designed by resident input, intended to create a safe place for the community, a neighborhood living room, the kind of place you grab a cup of coffee, catch up with a friend, and oh, there goes your doctor, because there's a full suite of healthcare services, vision, dental, behavior health, OBGYN, pediatric, maternity services, all kinds of care to meet the needs of the community in love. And that's the point, isn't it? We would stand for what is right, what is true, but we would do so in love. We would walk in grace and truth. And like Christ, we could be a safe place for all people. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the call upon our lives, the call that picked us up out of muck and mire sinful as we were, enemies of God, you saw in us the children you originally designed and the co-heirs of the kingdom you've intended us for all along. And your ability to receive us as we were, but love us and treat us and call us upward, Lord, according to our greatest potential and your design. As we follow you, it is your intention that we would model you in the way that we love others. In a broken world, there will be true evil and wrong and things we must stand against with courage. But in this broken world, you have sent us, O oh Lord, to love and to meet people right where they are and to invite them to join the family where we have been adopted because we would meet them, O oh Lord, with grace and truth, the grace and truth that comes through Christ. Give us the strength, give us the humility for you to be that Christ through us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Blessed be the dear uniting love that will not let us part. Though our nature frail, prone to divide, we remain one at heart. With us, wherever we may go, His Spirit calls to mind the wine and bread our Savior served in grace for all mankind. Oh, 
Blessed be the dear uniting love. Oh, blessed be the dear uniting love. We all are one who trust in Him, who crush the serpent's head. And raised us from the dead Oh may we ever walk with Him May nothing break our stride Nothing desire, nothing esteem Like Jesus crucified Oh blessed be First, I just want to say thank you, Eddie, for taking such a difficult sermon. Um, it was beautiful. We do live in very difficult and polarizing times where we're almost told that we have to choose sides on absolutely everything. But he reminded us that as Christians, we are actually not called to take any sides. We are called to be good, deep listeners. Thank you for such a beautiful reminder. And we would also really love for you to follow along with us on social media. You can see all of the great content we're putting out every week. And we would love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss another sermon. So that's all we have for you guys this time, and we'll see you next week.